that's my name, Peter. And I worked at Crop and Fit for 11 years. It's a dirty, dangerous job. But I work with the best men I've ever worked with in all my life. I'm Sheila. And although my dad wasn't a miner, my granddad and several uncles were over in Walls End where we came from. So you could say I come from mining stock. And I married a miner uh, who from Bates's Colliery in 1964. Well, my name's Joan. My father was a miner. My brother was a miner and I married a miner. That's all the mining people that were in our family. But I'm still the expert because my name's Cole. Uh -huh. Well, my name's Mary and I come from a little mining village just down the road from here, which is Camas. My granddad worked in Camas Pit for more than 50 years. And then I married a pitman in Peter, so I think I qualify as mining. My name's Cass. I married into a mining family. My husband's a miner, or well, was a miner, and his grandfather's grandfather's before that. So I actually married into a mining family. Well, my name's Margaret and I come from a pit community and my dad was a miner at Bates' Pit and Blythe all his life until he retired. My name is Yoda and my great-grandfather worked at Bates' Colliery and there's been a miner in every generation since then, either at uh, Isabella or Bates', ending with my father who worked mainly at Camus and Croft when he could get work. My name's Dennis, my granddad, and my father worked out in the pit at Stoke on Trent in Staffordshire. And we moved out to Ashington, and my father worked at Waterhall Curry. We worked there for five years, and then we moved on into Blythe's Gates of Pit, and walked there. And that's what I say. I was a miner, my two sons were miners, so actually we were all a miner family, so we did our share in the pits. My name's Ivy. My family are all miners. My granddad, my dad, uncles. I married Dennis and my two sons were miners. But I was born during the miners strike. But mind, not this last one. I was born in 19 broke it through. <laughs> Wait, how old are you? 21 plus five. Mine is a lot of that, but <laughs> never mind. I'm only 21. Never mind. When I was born, mining was considered. It went from father to son to grandson because it was considered a job. Once you had it, you were set for life. So when the doctor was coming down the stairs, he says to me, Dad, Mr. Common, I'm sorry, but it's a girl. And my dad turned round. I knew as soon as I heard her, I knew it was a lassie. He says, I heard her crying. And I think I've supposed to be crying ever since. <laughs> I was a windy bitch. <laughs> so we are the tellers. Okay. We came here to Woodhorn a little while ago to have a look at these paintings of the Ashton Pittman painters. And they give away a few memories. Really brought good memories back for what. Well, some good, some sad, but we've just, we've got the chance to give our feelings to you. And while we're going to tell you a few tears, we we'll hope that you have some memories as well. Well, this picture <coughs> is a time of rest and re to yeah. relax, and it's bed time by Jimmy Floyd. Uh, I walked the bearded pit for 34 years. In that photo there, the man having a beard in there, probably the man having a beard there, reminded me of my mad time when I had my beard down the pit. I used to take bread and jam down. Take water down, what the water? Now only again, now only again, I take a plastic tea, but you know, put milk in because it went sour down the pit. Meat, you didn't take meat down because the atmosphere down the pit. Probably and whatever when you meet up, but very nice. Also, I used to take cheese down, just take cheese down in the pit. And you would never take cheese down because there was mice down the pit, so I tracked the mice, right? But I can mind one day when I come off the pier for my beard, 
Og en pum, jeg har med min pøj, kom jeg bedre, og jeg tog med et doktor ud af pokken. Så jeg har været doktor i den. Det er en god plan. Der er en der lille black flies i nærmest, Dennis. Jamen, jeg har... Det er jo live and breed in the horse's muck. Down the pit. And they've got every way. We should take our bait, push it up our sleeve, twist the sleeve top and bottom, top it in my pocket, and they still manage to get in. But when you're hungry, it's done to tell you you just eat whatever's there. That was a little bit extra protein. <laughs> Nobody knows, but it's extra protein. Well, you hardly have to flush some toilets down there, did you? And you remember my man shooting one day, he says, you just shout, who coming down? <laughs> and they just used to shove it and throw it on the belt. <laughs> Aye, most people hadn't the faintest idea, did they, the conditions down in the pit, really. I remember one day when, during the miners' strike, I was at work and I was in the staff room having dinner with a colleague, and this lady was rather particular and a little bit posh, and she was going on and on and on about the miners and how they weren't so badly off. Ian, I couldn't resist. I turned to her and I said, would you like to eat your dinner where somebody's done their business? Hey, that soon should have up. I think it put her off her dinner and now, because I can't remember her finishing it. Uh, well, when you were eating down the pit, you had to tear the corner of your beard paper and you held your sarny in your hand. It was the only way to keep it clean because you were. Mm -hmm. There wasn't any cleanliness at all down the pit. So you just ate your beard like that, a bit of paper. Terrible conditions. Ooh, hell, yeah, no, that. There's one thing I missed down the pit after my beard was a cigarette. I, they were banned in the 19, early 1950s. They were banned from down the pit. Then they could lose their job in the court. And not only that, I mean, if you were, uh, well, you could even have jail, put you in the jail and all. If you were caught smoking a cigarette or a match down the pit, and that was it. And up the bank, and I know the street away. My dad used to chew baggy down the pit, and he used to get him a shilling screw every day. It was Uncle Jeff's shilling screw. And you know, it never went up in price, it was always a shilling. And I can remember, I don't think my dad would have gone to work without one. Well, I can remember my granddad used to smoke Uncle Jeff thin twist. And when they stopped them taking the backy and the, the cigarettes down the pit, my job was to go to Camus Pit with him and sit on the wall till he had his pipe and matches, with his pipe and the matches, and bring the pipe and the matches home, because it was more than their job's worth to take it down the pit. Everybody looked after everybody else. Nobody actually done without, because we had one bloke, happy to call him. He wasn't married. <coughs> he was a drinker but he never had money for bait. So he used to come to work, and he'd have a sandwich off this one, a sandwich off that one. End of the ship, he usually had more to eat than anybody else, but we looked after everybody at the pit. Well, this is a scene that was very familiar in the olden days, but less familiar in the modern days, I'm pleased to see. And this is a pit accident by Andy Rankin. Well, when I saw this painting, it reminded me of the accident my dad had down the pit when I was a babe, and the fact that he survived it. He was working in a seam, and it collapsed on top, and he had tons and tons of coal land on his back, and he was trapped down there all oh, for ages. Eventually, the rescue team got him out, and the doctors took one look at him and said he'd never walk again. So he was sent to hospital, and he was in hospital for a long, long time. And from the hospital, then he was sent to Hartford Hall. Now, Hartford Hall was the miners' rehabilitation centre in Northumberland, where slowly but surely he made a full recovery. Aye, and you know, when they had an accident down the pit and there was an explosion, fire, <clears throat> there was never anything left. It just cleared everything. But the management could always find a cigarette and a match. So the miners got the blame for it. It was never their fault, mind, on the pit. Aye, and the miners used to go down the pit in cages, as you'll see from the next photograph. They look as if they're bent over, double nearly ready for a game of leapfrog. But I remember already coming in from work one day, and the cage had dropped. Not very far, mind, but all the men are getting a hell of a fright, I can tell you. And he ended up with a bad neck. 
Oh, yeah, I remember the cages like because I we worked in a sweet factory called Redheads, and we had a lift day. And I remember yeah. getting in it one day, and I'm standing there, and I, it's like a lever, and you press the lever to take it down. The, the, the whole of the lift shaft just went from the top to the bottom. So I know what it's like to have whiplash things. Ah, and if somebody lit up when you were bent over like that, mate, you'd suck up. Hey, well, you know what they're saying? Peace Wherever time. you be, let your wind go free. In church or in chapel, let, let the bugger rattle. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> the most common accidents in the pit, basically, were people losing their fingers on the machines. Had a hand on top of the machine, and the machine would lift up and go up and catch your fingers on the roof. And there it was. I got shot once down the pit in the back. I should have been 20 yards farther away from the face side, but I was only 10 yards. Sometimes you've got to do that, but get back to your walk quicker. And when the shot fire stemmed the woods and he fired the shots, I was only 10 yards away from the, the blast. And I got hit in the back, and I'll tell you what, it was bloody sore and all, I can tell you. His charge hand would have gotten finished if he had, they said he had been shot. But never mind, he had this wound on the back of his uh, neck there. Oh, and he used to, as it was healing, you know, it's bone flesh and it's, oh, a horrible smell. I'm not going to touch him. <laughs> <laughs> It stunk at our back, his back here, and during the night, if he turned around and his back was faced us, he said, turn around, you bugger, you're cutting me sick. It did, it literally made you sick, the smell of the blood. Uh, if you have an accident doing the pit in them days, you had to phone the bank for the doctor. And many them doctors came doing it and they got into some funny places, dangerous places. They were, they were heroes. But, we had a first aid cabinet bank and we had the nurse would come into the baths when you were getting, you had to get in to get ready. They would come in if somebody was injured and they just walked the room. Nobody thought not about it. Till one day Joe Fox's wife come in. Has anybody seen more Joe? Well, have you seen her trying to hide in lockers? <laughs> wrapping towels around herself? <laughs> I've never seen so many shy people in my life. Aye. Did they tell you about that accident a minute ago? They were just minor accidents. There was a serious accident happening on the face that I was working on. I went in on a Saturday night shift, extra shift, and we get in by and get to the deputy's meeting station. It was an employer right around the pit. And we were sent, me and my were sent on my face, and uh, along with a fitter. <coughs> And we're going to do maintenance work on the machines, right? But one would have to go 180 yards farther up the face for they would do some drilling in the coal. So, right? So we did this. And I said to me, my dad said, look, he gone on the machine with the fitter and help him. Now I'll go up the face and do the drilling, 180 yards, like I said. Right? Fair enough, then. So, uh, my mother was out the fitter. Now, what he was going to do was to check the drums on the machine, which was four foot wide. And Three foot high in diameter with picks in. And uh, all he had to do was switch the machine on so the drum would go around about a couple of foot and switch it off again. Well, the fitter is at the other side of the face, beside the machine where the drum is, where all the picks is in there. And they would examine the drum when it went around this couple of foot. Take a pet shop, uh, blunt pick out, put a, a short one in. So that's all he had to do. And we'd say, right, you are, Bill. Again, switch her on and switch her up. Couple of foot, exactly the same as what he did before. Right, what bell? Did it again. So it happened. He switched it on next time. He said, Right, what bell? And he switched it on. Only the fitter wasn't quick enough to come back away from the drum. And he got caught in the picks of the drum. And, I tell you, and he went around with the drum. It's a nasty accident, man. I mean, that fitter died instantly because it was that really bad. This, this accident, and uh, my mother 
you went out, you phoned me up, what you call the main gate, it's the main entrance of the face. And he phoned me up and he was shouting, he was shouting on the phone, Dennis, come down here, hurry up. Obviously it was too late, like, and the man was mauled up. We was, it was cut, literally cut. And uh, obviously you've got to phone your manager up, safety workers, four safe people. I mean, it's a waste of time because that man was totally dead. And uh, my Mara went out in the gateway, shaking like a leaf, which was obvious, he was shaking like a leaf. And that man never worked down the pit again. Never go back to work for it for that acting. I'll tell you what, it's the worst acting I've ever seen now in the paint, and I've seen some. So it can be dangerous, I can tell you that. If the men had an accident, though, the pits would never admit it was an accident. They used to get sick. But if they could prove it was an accident they'd had, they used to get campaign. But mind you, didn't get campaign off the coal company, it was off the government. And if you had been on the sick with a bad accident for three months, do you know they even stopped your call, took that off you? Because you had had an accident. Mm. Bad accident, isn't it? Disgrace. Mm. Well, that's easy. Yes. My great grandfather, had, he lost an eye in an accident <coughs> down Bates' pit. That was in the 1920s. And all he got to feed his family was a shilling campaign a week. And he had a family of three. And he also got a job called a colliery caller, or a knocker upper, as it was locally called. And this was to knock at the upper windows and wake the men for the early shift. And for that, he got paid a couple of pennies each a week from the men, not from the pit. Got note for now to name days. Well, down the pits, different pits work different shifts. And this one is the off shift by Oliver Kilbone. Hi, this is my favourite one. Walking down the pit was an unpleasant business. So when it was shift lows, you couldn't wait to get up quick enough. And my wash shift was at 2 o'clock in the morning. Because at 2 o'clock in the morning, if you walked a doubler, it was dark when you went down, and it was still dark when you got up. And you know, you've gone all week and never see daylight. I used to hate that. I mean, for a long time and now, you know, you never got any money for any shift neither, I mean. No, shift walk oh. uh, didn't get paid. No. I mean, when they decided to pay your shift walk, they give us seven shillings a week, and then they took 12 shillings a week off of our wet money. And walking in wet, I mean, you're talking two and three foot of water, and you're walking in it. And the day that they took that off me, I says, I've had enough. If they want to take the money off me for walking there, I'm finished. So I went away that day and wrote me notice out. And it was the best thing I ever done. Finish the pit. I, I once uh, complained about working in three foot of water. I had to get some panels, it's electric things, and you put your cables on. And this is what says to me, it says, go along the face here, along the, the main gate, and I want you to get these two panels out, which is electric stuff, in three foot of water. And I had to go six yards in for it, seek them. I said, I knew we am going in there, I mean. I said, no way am I going in there unless I get that water pumped out. I said, I haven't got a pump. I let it get out. I said, I'm not going in there. Well, I said, I send the bank. No, they've got none. I said, well, right. I said, I'm not going in. I said, send it to the bank if you want to, but I'm not going in that water for nobody. So he put it on another job, right? So it comes here in the week, Friday. I goes to me, the board got me a clock and ink card, and he has a notice stuck in the front. You're in night shift next week, half past five at night, whereas I've been in half past ten in the morning. Yeah. Took any notice of it. A couple of days later on, when the Mara says, now we put that on your card. No. So he said, was the omen? He says, you put that in the card, put your night shift to pay you for not walking in that water. That is my punishment. I was in that ship for nearly ah, but five years in that ship. Just because I wouldn't get in that water. And I'll tell you what, I'll tell you what. 
When the pits closed in 85, then panels are still in that water yet. With three foot, it'll be about eight foot now. They're still doing that pit there yet. But I think, I, when I'm sitting thinking about it, I'm, I'm thinking I'm getting older and older by the minute because I can remember when Bates's pit didn't even have pit baths. Mm -hmm. And the min miners used to come home to get bathed. Now, a lot of the miners lived in the colliery houses and such like, and they had a tin bath. But we lived in Marvin's Close and we had a proper bath. Oh. 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 And constant yes. hot water. Oh. The fires were kept on all day long because the miners worked such different shifts. But we never had to have a tin bath. We oh. had a proper bath. No. You were not typically. You were partial. Yes, we were. Well, yeah, I can remember once. He was working at Bates's, but they did have baths there. Yeah, you know, I'm I'm but they had a power cut out. this day, and there was no hot water. So he had to come home dirty. Why, the bairns had never seen him dirty. Mm -hmm. And this big, black, dirty, clarty man comes in the house in Morden East, ran out screaming. She didn't know, was I dead? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, one of the worst jobs we had a day was to dab their men's clears, mm. just take them outside and dab them against the mark. Then used to get the broom and broom the cloths off them. You know that's where the same comes from, I'll dab you look. That's it. That's it. That's it. That's it. That's it. That's it. Dennis, what did you do when you first came out after your shift? What was the first thing you did? I'll tell you the first thing I did when I used to come out. I'd get the bank. I went straight to my time card. I just have a card down there. You just have a cigarette behind your time card when I got the bank. Put it there. Cigarette in the match. Put that there when you went down the pit. So it was there when you came back up to you have a smoke straight away. And you come up and went straight to there, take the cigarette out the back of your card, light it up. And you just took a couple of drags. You say, oh, that's really beautiful. Because you never had a smoke for seven and a quarter hours, mind. When I had doing the pit seven and a quarter hours, you never ever had a smoke as such like. It was a pleasure to smoke that cigarette. I did like being in bloody heaven, it was. <laughs> oh, it's great. Ah, it was good when you watched them come out of the pits, put their lamps up, grab a tab, have a smoke, and then knock them dizzy straight away. They were sitting on the deck and lying up against the wall. Some of them in a hurry to get home, they jump on the bike, and you could see them like this. Weird. <laughs> and it's not the first time I've seen them fall off before they got to the pit gates. <laughs> well, that's because they didn't have a cigarette, didn't it? No. That's how good tabs are for you. Right. Um, my dad used to work for strip. They used to come in from work about half past seven in the morning. And my dad had his main meal before he went to bed. But we were getting up for school length. And I've gone to school and I've had mince and dumplings for my breakfast. Oh, <laughs> breakfast? Yes, but I like liver and bacon and with onion gravy. Oh, wow. Oh, yes. I wish my mum didn't believe in wasting anything you had what my dad had and that was it. He was boss. Oh, the posh liver. Yes. <laughs> Where did your dad work, Dennis? He worked here at Wotorn. Aye. Yeah. I. I worked here at Wotorn and i have seen him come here at the end of his shift, mind, on his bicycle, because he used to live at Ashton. And he'd come back on his bicycle, dirty, like they say there, red. And he would take his dirty clothes off from the backyard. And he would go in the sitting room, lie on a proggy mat. That's what the wives used to do in them days, make proggy mats, clippy mats. And he would lie on the proggy mat in front of the blazing fire. Just for half an hour, mind. Half an hour's kit. That's all he wanted. Just half an hour's kit when he came up. Still black, mind. Still black. And we had half an hour. And then, mind, you didn't make a noise. Because if you be made a noise, mind, you'd get to put a good twanging on the back of your bum, I'll tell you. And that was after your mother, not up in. But anyway, when he woke up, he got himself a bath and whatever. And have his dinner. Go in the garden and the lot, mind. Look after the leaves and so forth for a couple of hours. I come back in again, read the paper, have a cup of tea, have a sandwich, and we have to bed. And that was his shift, and that's what I used to do when he used to come home from work. He was that tight. So, they had busy. 
Aye, when, when you were in shift work, you slipped when you could. Aye. And you know what? I said, night kid. I was again to bed, and the number of night sleep I lost because a woman standing in the back street. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> One woman, her voice would go straight through the brick wall. <laughs> Jean ran free sitting there. <laughs> I lost mad night sleep through all. Wait, dears. Dears, dears sleep through all than anybody else. Aye. It was, it was awful in them days. <laughs> she never stopped yet. <laughs> yeah. She wouldn't be the only one near I'll tell you. Well, this is the end of another working week. This is TV by Arthur Wynnum. Now, this is one of my favourites because it, I think it was everybody's favourite day of Friday because everybody got paid. But when I married Peter, we had £7.4 in a week. Down the pits, that was in 1960. And I worked in Newcastle at the time. People in Newcastle thought every mine in Villager Street was paid for gold. All the rich miners, they wouldn't believe what miners were working for. So at the finish, I took a paycheck in, and they were shocked at what men was going down the pit for in 1960. I, when I jacked in and I went into the factories, I more than doubled my pay, and I had to stay clean. <laughs> and they do, and they make double the beer. Yeah, but all the men didn't have very bad wages. Some had decent wages, some had good wages, some had bad wages. How they used to work, it was they used to, men used to all go to the welfare and they used to have this contraption that looked like a bingo machine. And they used to draw their names out. It was called the Kevil for some reason. And the first few out got the best jobs. And it's, they went on and on and on. And if you were last out, you got the worst job. And that's how they used to work it. But they used to work in groups. And when it was pay time, there was only one man go and get the pay. And he, they used to share it out amongst them. And for some reason, one day, this um, man sent his wife for the pay. <gasps> there was all hell let loose. And from then on, from that day, till she died. She was always known as Mrs. Nosy Parker because she had been told all the women what their men got for that baby. <laughs> well, my man, his mother used to work at the pit canteen. So she would pick his wages up for him. And uh, he never sold her mind, but she did give him his pocket money. She paid for his tabs and mm. put money to his side for him. And she used to buy him a co-op stamps. So by the time we got married, he had nearly 2,000 pounds in co-op stock. Cool. So yeah. well, yeah. 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 That was a good start. Yeah. Uh, well, I remember once, me and me, you know, these men that has keeping backs, I don't know they said they were nowadays. <laughs> Uh, well, my uncle had keepy bags. My nanny didn't know about it till she put this money in the drawer. She had four bands and they needed shoes and she had no money for them. So my auntie Jess took this money, got the four bands, a pair of shoes. My, and my uncle Bill wondered where the shoes come from. But he don't ask me Auntie Jess, she was only a little woman, but mine she was boss. <laughs> he shouldn't have had keep you back. No, he shouldn't have had yeah, no. no. But all did, didn't they? They did. Mm -hmm. well, I don't have keep you back. I don't know. No, because... <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. Then he used to keep his under the bedroom carpet. Oh. But you found it. Oh, oh, I knew where it was. Uh, <laughs> Tommy just used to keep his in his bathroom <clears throat> pocket, oh. and he's still in the wardrobe. I knew how much that was because sometimes I counted it, but it made us more mad than enough. I mean, I dare not touch it, mate. And his, he was saving up for his week. He had a, I, I, I know this sounds horrible, but he had a fantastic week. And I had a lovely new suit. Ian, can anybody remember the pit towels? By main height. We used to have plain ones, but you could get them straight. And here's the one I made earlier. <laughs> <laughs> How old did he say this was, Joe? Oh, oh, well over 20, 20, 25 years old. Hey, and still in good condition. Better than you can buy nowadays oh, in yeah. any shop. Oh. Never been used. It has. <laughs> the, this, these ones used to be able to get um, beach towels from the yeah, pit. Yeah, Three pound a pair they were. He and these dolphins have swam in all the waters of the world. Oh, <laughs> oh. <laughs> 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 <laugh
like with Scarborough, but oh, of course you also would like to get an All of the places I went. Mind me, nieces and nephews used to borrow them as well. It wasn't just us. No. Do you remember as well when the, ba the women used to have a brand new penny on on a Friday because it was, it was special that day. Oh, so yeah. you got your penny yeah. buzz. <laughs> yes. yes. Oh, yeah. Yeah. But mind you, Blythe Marketplace was always heaving at the weekend yeah. with everybody yes. out doing their shopping. But mind you, we were always checking out what bargains they could get now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Ah, lots of people get paid on a Friday, Link. Mm -hmm. You're walking through the pit and you finished up at five o'clock, the pier office was shut. And you couldn't get paid on the Monday because it was not on the weekend, right? Mm -hmm. You were spent about a weekend because there was no such thing. No, 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 no well, I had to pay for everything, was I was part of your wages, you got a note from them, lot. This one is a miner's hobby by Jimmy Floyd. Now, some of the miners had allotments, which was mostly their the famous hobbies. And we used to have an allotment, of course. And um, <laughs> it, was, it was only about 10 minutes from Malvin's Cross. And we'd just grow ordinary things, mind, like potatoes and carrots and cabbage and mint and stuff like that, like, you know. No asparagus, John. No, but we grow them roasted now. Mm. And um, call rabbi and all that sort of thing mm. there. But um, we didn't have a, a pigeon loft in our garden because we kept pigs and we had um, a, a pig sty. And all oh, we had a favourite pig, we used to call her Daisy Bell. Mm. It's funny, Raquel, it was delicious. <laughs> <laughs> the miners kept the, 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 the allotments really for growing veg and keeping chickens and substituting the food for other families. And mind, it was all organic because you could get a free motor when you were from the pit. Mm. Mind, you had to pay ten children to get a dinner then. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> so so it was free. So I was a catcher, didn't I? There you are. Well, my stepfather, he had his pigeons. And he never had a holder in his life because he wouldn't leave the pigeons. They were his pride and joy, and nobody else was allowed to have anything to do with them. He used to even buy these little gooey eggs that screwed in half, put a worm in, screwed it back together again, stick it under the board, and it, when he was sending it away to be raced, it thought that the egg was hatching. So it came back all the quicker, thinking it was ready to. To have a board. <coughs> All the tricks of the tree, that was mine. <laughs> uh, uh, then it was a leaf short, Peter. Oh. When a leaf short, my life. That's oh, when you know uh, your mates were made. When a leaf short was made. Aye, because you spent your night in the shed, right. the garden shed, with a shotgun. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> because somebody yeah, was going to be coming round to slash your leaks if you thought you had better ones than him. Right. Uh, we made it, Peter. I mean, I don't know how far it's true, but you know what I was told? The best thing to feed your leaks on. We have our losses. Recycle beer. Oh, oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. He made it. it was worth it because I mean the prizes for the leak shows then were absolutely fabulous. They were they were really smashing. We used to get bedroom sweets, dining room sweets, all sorts of different things. I know one year when Tommy Wilma got a lovely coffee table. Mm. Oh. It would be better than everybody else. It was, it definitely was, and I've still got it. Still and I'm still it. Is it not gold plated, John? No, but it's a marble, lovely marble. Oh. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, I thought the best, small, the best thing was the morning after. Oh, wow. Everyone oh, would take yeah. a day off work and they would go out to the club for that league broth. Yeah, yeah. But mine, I'll tell you what, the prize winners always cut the seeds out because they didn't want anybody else growing them the following year. I tell you what, mine, did you notice? None of the good leak club, leak draw air uh, with it. Leak leak partners, they the winners. never ever had any of the broth, you know. Right? <laughs> <laughs> I know. <laughs> 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 they had more sense, haven't they? Yeah, that's stupid, you know. Don't oh, know that. Oh, that's it. Well, I bless Peter. Thank you very much. Thank you. 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 Thank
my parents were teetotal, so they never went into a club. What you missed? Well, this one is Whippets by George Blessing. Now, this is one of my favourites because my sister and her husband used to run Whippets. So, do you know why mine has kept Whippets and not Greyhounds? Well, I'll tell you, because Whippets run in a straight line, the Divinita track. But the women used to sit at home in their colours for their dogs and used to knit them in red, blue, green and yellow. And whatever trap your dog was in, that was the colour that you put the colour on. I'm so interested in the, the, the whippets. Then some of the miners used to play pitch and toss and used to play it on the top field after they'd come from work and they'd get in their pay and that. And there's a lot of them lost their pay then. Mm. And we used to bet on two, ben two pennies coming down the right way. And of course it was illegal. So they had people posted out keeping an eye in case the police come. And if the police was coming anywhere near, they used to just whistle. And everybody scattered and ran like hell. Well, betting and gambling was illegal in them days, but there was still a lot of it went on. The bookies runners called diddlers, they used to come down the back lanes to collect the bets. Uh, but mind the police had to see money changing hands before they could do anything. Oh, we never had to go into the queue in the back lane, so I put bets on. Oh. In Malvin's clothes, we used to have take our bets to Mrs Lamb's. You just used to knock on the door and she used to come, you used to give her the money with the bet in your hand. My dad's gambling name was Rusty. Rusty? Rusty, I don't know why, but that's what put, put on his bets, uh -huh. <laughs> well, some of you will recognise the working man's club. And this is Saturday Night by Oliver Kilbone. Yeah, this is one of my favourites, mind. The heart of the community is the welfare of the working men's clubs. And when the clubs were being built, you had the chance to buy into a share. And mind these were usually inherited by the grandsons and sons and that of the family. And it was found on for someone to sell their shares. They would never be allowed back in the club again. And that's for sure. My man inherited his from his grandfather. And his number now becomes number three. Well, when your man was, went to the club though, it was like the British Secret Service. They wouldn't tell you now that went down inside. You're laughing. You're not all about it. <laughs> <laughs> You've had it. <laughs> when they used to come out, sit went down with their moods, maybe they could complain if their dinner wasn't ready, but they wouldn't tell you what went down in the club. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Hey, can you remember, lasses? You couldn't get in the bar. You used no, to have no. to sit in the back room and ring the bell on the thing if you wanted a drink. All right, for the lads, mate. These lot was in the bar playing dominoes, bar skittles, darts. It was definitely a man's environment in them days, oh, yeah. yes. sure. Cheap beer, oh, yeah. everybody knew everybody else. It but they, the, not like the day, it was members only. It was the only place where we could get rest from yeah. this man. <laughs> the only, the only place where we could get rid of the nugget. Peace and quiet. I mean, you didn't swear or not in the streets in them days. Not the way that they know, oh. swearing. Well. So when you got into the clubs, you could hear all the dirty jokes. <laughs> <laughs> well, Great. thank goodness for Emily Davison, because she fought for women's rights, men must stay bloody fighting yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, My grandma, she got so sick of the granddad that coming home for his Sunday lunch on time. That this one week she took the plate and stomped down to the pub and plugged it in front of him on the counter. Wow! Well, I mean, it's a wonder I didn't expect it every week after that. Oh, <laughs> that was the start of the pub. Oh, sure. 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 yeah. mm -hmm. This one, you'll see just how hard women worked in the Indias. Because this is the wash house by Len Robinson. Uh, well, you know what the wa wash houses were like? Can you remember them? They were just a little, like, just a little hot thing at the bottom of their yard. It had its pot boiler in and three planks of wood. That's what you used to scrub your clays with. And you used to either have a possum stick, or if you were lucky, you had a gas washer. 
And who used to hand? John would have had one of these. Yes, oh, yeah. Yeah. you yes. Made to them. <laughs> they were made, were passed, then were scrubbed, then you put them in the boiler. Can anybody remember Dolly Blues? Oh, oh. Yes. You used to have a little Dolly Blue and you used to rinse it in the water. And after your clothes come out of the boiler, they used to go in the washer again and you had to sauce them around again. Made Jack whites, whiter than white. <laughs> but mind these young uns nowadays didn't know their bone. They've got automatic washers, automatic dryers, automatic spinners. The hardest part of their washing is press the, the button. button. <laughs> well, my grandmother used to do a washing in front of the fire. She was her grandmother now, oh, that's yeah, where we yeah. live. And she passed this hard that day that it went through the floor, clean through to the flat downstairs. Well, our friend lived downstairs, so they didn't bother repairing the floor. Put a board over it and a clippy mat. And on a night, I used to turn them back and they used to sit and talk to each other. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I tell you what, it was cheaper than BT. <laughs> Well, you know, my mother had one of those hot boilers you're on about, and it was bricked into the corner of the yard. So, of course, the, the little grate was underneath to put the fire in, mm -hmm. heat up the water. Well, with it being outside, it was always damp and hard to light. So, my mother got the solution. She used to come into the kitchen, she'd get a shovel full of fire. Oh. <laughs> And carry it through. Well, we kids had to stand well back from the flames as she carried it through into the yard. And that was how she lit the fire. Yeah, right. It was a dangerous business, was washed in. Mm -hmm. Didn't know nothing about her to say. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> well, I was the bed in the family, me. And mate, I always come home from school on a Monday. I was the first one in. So my job was in charge of the mangle. Until one day, my, my mother had knit this lovely jumper. That uh, put it through the mangle, didn't I? And just started growing and growing and growing <laughs> till it was massive. Mind, I wasn't going to charge that again, I tell you. This is the family's hobby. This is Prodding the Mat by Oliver Kilborn. Mm. Yeah, I like this picture because it reminds me of how warm and cosy our front room was when I was a child. And in front of the fire, we had one of these proggy mats. I used to look to sit on it. But I was fascinated by how they were made. And I used to watch my granny and my mother bake them. And they used to sew the hessian into the wooden frames. And I was were about as long as this table. And then they would draw roughly a pattern on the hessian. And after that came the long job of cutting all the clippings up in all the different colours. And you either use recycled clothes or you bought packets of the uh, remnants from a tailor's shop if you were lucky to have one and uh, then they used to prog in the clippings into the hessian row by row following the pattern and when they were finished there was a pecking order in the house where they were placed and the last one being the newest was put in front of the fire because that was pride of place mm -hmm. and all the rest got shunted around into different rooms well, I've got many happy memories of sitting by the fireside, particularly on a Sunday night. Now, my dad had his favourite tray, and now we didn't have a television, because my dad always said television spoke the art of conversation. But we had a red effusion wireless, but you could also have accumulator radios. I don't know whether anybody had one of those. Well, we had the red effusion. And my memories are of mainly on a Sunday night, listening to sing something simple on the wireless, toasting our bread and the fireside, and <laughs> looking in the fire to see what pictures you could make out the ember. Hey, I've st still got a real fire. So have I. <laughs> <laughs> and I've got a yard full of coal to go with it. Oh. Well, I haven't. So you're going to begin first. <coughs> Well, you know, in the fireplaces, though, on Fridays, that used to be a cleaning day. You used to have to put, put the black lead on, then you had to brush the black lead off, then the shiny parts where the oven was. Did you have them in our No, we had a different sort of fireplace oh, altogether. Oh, no. Never mind. 
we had a black range with the oven, but we also had the rail at the top for drying your towels. But mind, you could only use that during the week because Friday was cleaning day. We used to have to clean this brass rail with that bone. Now, from Friday to Monday, you were not allowed to dry your towel because you were dirty the rail. <laughs> and we used to have around the top, like a palmet, and it used to match the yeah, table, yeah, top, yeah, sure. and that's it. Yeah. Uh -huh. And on top of your fireplace, of your mantelpiece, yeah. uh, did we have, we would have a clock and these stuff at your dogs, did you? No, but ours was a little nice little mantelpiece, you didn't put anything on it. Oh, oh yeah, yeah. well, ours was a big one, so I had a clock. But my mother just had two wet vases on the edges. We weren't rich enough to have uh, oh, the well, loaves. If we'd had room, but we probably had gold plates of those. Probably. <laughs> probably. <laughs> well, this one will make all your mouths water. This is fish and chips by Fred Nadler. Fish and chips. Do you know what it is? I can still see, taste and smell those fish and chips from all those years ago. There was nothing nicer than going home with your fish and chips wrapped up in paper. You used to plug a hole in so you could get your rear hand in to eat your chips on the way home, smothered in salt and vinegar. Eee, hey, there was nothing. They don't taste the same nowadays, do they? Well, some of you young ones will not know like, but they don't, they don't taste the same. And hey, mind, when we were young, that was a cheap, fairly cheap meal. Hey, you didn't get much change from a fiver these days, do you? But mainly, Thank Sheila, you. it was all the suspense that was sent. Oh, wow. You'd stand in the queue outside the fish shop, your money in your hand, and it was all wrapped up on a piece of paper that your mother had wrote the order on. Oh, that's true. Then you go in, I wouldn't care, it was that little, you couldn't see over the counter. You just had to put your hand up and they take the money off you. But mind you, I mean, I love me chips, but you know what I like more than chips? Scrumptions. Oh, you wow. know what scrumptions are? It's back then, it is, isn't it? Mm -hmm. right. Lovely. Oh yeah, I've got a nice little story. It's a policeman one. And we always had this favourite policeman. You know when you had to beat police? I used to walk, walk up and down the streets and making sure you were all right now. Well, this one night, my mother said, she says, I've got to get some chips from, for, the, for our supper. So, Matt Mahar was walking up the street and my mother went up the front door and she says, Hey, Ma, why are you going? He says, well, I'm just on my beat. She says, well, do you feel like I got the chip and get the beds? That's supper, man. So he went with the chippy and uh, he got all the chips and that for supper and he comes back down the street with him. All of a sudden the sergeant comes back up the street and he looked at him and he says, Sergeant, what I've got to do with these? So he stuffed them inside of his helmet, didn't he? <laughs> Walking down the street, all the police run down his face. <laughs> the sergeant told him, he said, Why? Oh, he says, You've got a sweat on, lad. He didn't realise it was fish and chips on him. Well, my favourite chippy. I had a bakery next door to it. So when you had a few pints and you're on your way home, you called in at the bakery and it was in the back door, of course, and you had a tub of margarine. You bought a half dozen buns, put at them next door into the chippy, and what a way to end your night. Chip buddies all the way, yeah. I've got a good drink. This one's close to all your hearts. This one is this Mother and Child by Oliver Kilbourne. Uh, our mums, how special they were. Uh, you know, true. you hear people say the women in the olden days had it easy. They stopped at home, they didn't go out to work. But let me tell you, then women worked harder than anybody I've ever met. There was no washing machines, no hovers, fridges, microwaves. There was no like that. It was all done by our hand. They did their shopping daily, they did their washing on a Monday. Then there was the cleaning, the cooking, the baking, the mending. And then there was the spains. There were always there for the spains, whether it was the bathe the cut, or the tone of skippy roll. They never had us spains doing that was warm of us. Aye, women had a rough time in them days. I can remember my mother. It was work, work, work. Cleaning, cooking, everything. But everything she did, she always did it with a great sense of pride. At the end of the day, she used to look around and think, I've done it right. 
Well, my mother could turn her hand to anything. She could cook, sew, <coughs> tat, knit. She used to do all the decorating as well as the baking. But mine, in our house, she was the disciplinarian. Now, there was me and my brother, and you know what kids are like. If there was anything that had gone wrong, who's done that? It wasn't me, it was him. It wasn't me, it was her. Well, my mother would have none of that. Out would come the Bible. And she would say, right, hand on the Bible. Did you do it? You sure always found out who did it, mine, because you wouldn't dare tell a lie with your hand on the Bible. Mm -hmm. Never. When my mother was boss, but when, she, when I was just a bairn, she had a lot of ill health and we had to go and live with my grandma for a while. That if anything went wrong, it used to be my dad that used to play well with her. But never mind, I was daddy's pet. Mm. But if I did anything wrong, mate, I never did. Oh, oh no. no. But my mum used to say, that chair in the corner, sit there till your dad comes home. And mind you don't want to get off that seat. You don't want to get off that seat till your father come home. And he would say, what are you doing, honey? And I said, I don't know, dad. And he said, well, that's all right. We'll do it again now. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we did, haven't we? My dad was the head of our household, really, because she had to be, because my dad was away in Coventry during the war. But she uh, had quite a few skills, and she used them to decorate our house. Yeah. And we had uh, fancy cushions and curtains that she sewed, and proggy mats on the floor. And we had embroidered pictures on our walls. And being a dressmaker, she used to make all our clothes. And to make ends meet, she would take in orders, and she always worked from home though, because she wouldn't go out and leave us. My mother, like the heads, were hard work. My mother used to go down into Ashington on a bicycle, to a shop. I don't know what kind of weather it was, she went to. She would swill the yard twice a week, twice a day, sorry, twice a week, she would swill the yard, and to clean the windows, by them days, they were on satchels, so you had to push them up, not like they are now, you had to push them up. And she used to do the upstairs windows, push the window up, go out, sit on the window, so pull it down again, to stop it from falling in the garden. And after that, that weekend, for our pleasure, relaxation, my mother used to play the harp, she used to play the harp good. My father used to play tinkle on the ivory on the piano. Then. And you said, ask the neighbours in for a night. You said, have a bit sing song, or they might play cards or dubbing words. That's what she used to do after the hard big work that they did. I mean, they did hard work, they did hard work, I'm telling you. I didn't realise that everybody's man wasn't perfect, mind. I must have been quite naive. But when anybody says, remember your man when you were little, I remember my man in this sports costume. It was heapy sports, actually. And it was um, a jacket and a skirt. And she had two blouses for the summer and two jumpers for the winter. That's all my mum ever wore when I was a bane. And I remember my auntie Lil saying once, yes, because Nell saved all her clothing companies for to buy the bane's things. That's how my mum only had the one outfit. Mm -hmm. Well, my mum was pretty much like everybody else, so she could turn her hand to most things, cooking, sewing, knitting, decorating. But I think she was a bit before her time, actually, because DIY was her forte. Not that she was very good at it, mind, because she went upstairs this day to make the bed, and divans were just coming in then. And she got it in her head, she wanted a divan. So ten minutes later, she sent my brother down for the soap. <laughs> Ten minutes after that, just said, my brother for the clothes line. He's sitting up there laughing because he can remember. <laughs> so by this time, my dad's curiosity had got the better of him, so up the stairs he went and tanked the seat to saw at the end of the bed. And the legs went like that. <laughs> he was tying the legs together with the clothes line. He'd say, nobody will see it under the blank. Well... <laughs> <laughs> The thing I remember about my mother was when uh, we were little, we hardly had any money in that, but um, we did the best we could, and I always remember us saying, right, I'm going to bingo the night. Whose turn is it if I win anything? Hmm. So I put my hand up and I said, my mum, I says, I've seen this coat, it's in Haxon's window. This is a shop at Waterloo Road in Blythe. And I said, um, 
And I love that coat, took those like, like brown fleck and the fur colour on. She's right, I win it, you can get that. So she was told I weren't me. She won a big one that night, so the next morning. And we went to the shop and got this coat and I put it on and I walked up and down that back lane all day. Dear Lamb was like the bee's knees and it was lovely. <laughs> That's my mother. <laughs> well, this is normally where we'll finish our story time. But this is a bit special because this is the occasion for the remembrance of the minor picnic, which was the most popular thing of the day. And I'm just going to tell you one of the tears from the picnic. Mm. No. The main thing I remember about the picnic, it just seemed like it was always fine with her. Really red hot. But on one occasion, the heavens opened and it poured down. And when I was a teenager, so it's a while back. You know? <laughs> Everybody was running for the buses, but we didn't live far away, so me and me How it would just run home. So we sat away, top of the bank, there's a little green <coughs> grocer's, general dealers. Came in a bit back, so we went in, a couple of packets of biscuits, set away down the bank, swans on the river, where the heavens was coming down, so they said, well, I already saw them. We went into the river to start and feed the swans. And then we all out the last at the hangar. There was two buses full of people, we had to get across this little, foot, the little bridge. So we're then laughing, we thought they were on the road, right? Gene Kelly had just made this film, Sing and the Rain. <laughs> so we did. Give the phone. Phone walks. Well, everybody on the bus was happy. Yeah. They were just laughing at two mothers. <laughs> Man, I still have been Gene Kelly. I'm not a real worry of who's doing it. Come in, Hollywood. We had a miner's picnic. Oh, yeah. Well, as I said, my dad wasn't a miner, but I had a friend whose dad worked with Camus Hollywood, so we used to follow the Camus band then. Um, but hey, I tell you this much. Hey, when you were a teenager, the miner's picnic was a great place to suss up the talent, wasn't it, Peter? Yeah. You didn't look very far from that, was there? Or no, I didn't see you. <laughs> didn't see you there. Well, as I've given into it, I am a lot older because I can remember the picnic being at Morpeth. And Clive and Morpeth used to have the same MP. Now, we used to go to the picnic and we used to go and have a picnic on the standards and down by the river and everything. But once the, the speeches started, my dad would say, Come on, we've got to listen to the speeches. And you heard the band and that. But once the speeches had finished, man, we used to always come home. My dad didn't think the picnic was a picnic. My dad thought the picnic was something really serious. That's how we didn't get any go to the shores or anything. Oh, what a shame. Mm -hmm. Well, my dad was a bandsman, so we had to be there every year. So from the year I was born, I was taken to a picnic. And I remember at first uh, it was Blythe Beach. And then we used to get the train when it was at Morpeth. And then eventually it changed to Bedlington. And I went every year's picnic until I got a job. And then I was working, so that was when I stopped going. Nobody had the picnic many years ago. <laughs> <laughs> the little lassie it was bought for was sitting in the audience today, except it's not that little these days. <laughs> but it was a divided day in our family, you see, because he supported Cooper and Crofton and I supported Camus. So unfortunately, we were different ends of the field. <laughs> <laughs> My mum used to take me and my sisters to the picnic. And we're getting done at the picnic. And all I can remember is the crowds of people there. And then the marching bands came down. And then the pitmen with their banners. But you knew when it was your dad's pit, because your mothers would say, come on, here's ours, come clap and cheer. And you had a clap and cheer. And then we'd all thought, go down the bank to the field, because the adults liked to listen to the speakers. I mean, we didn't like the speakers as kids. But we had to behave if you didn't get the show field. 
and on the way back, I mean, Mary's shown you that doll. There was other stalls with dolls on strings like that, but had beautiful lace oh, dresses and that. And there was pink and there yellow, orange, purple, all different colours. And then you got the man with the little monkey, and you used to put it in your hands and take your photos. But your mother's had a pay for the photo. Mm. Then we'd go down to the show field, and there was the dodgems and the roundabouts and the helter skelter. And after all that, and say, well, we've had a good day, time to go home. Meant we had a great day. Mm -hmm. Great. My remembrance of the picnic when I was playing was all the bands come together, the jazz bands and everything. And I was in the jazz band, which was the British Legion jazz band. And um, we used to come down and do our marches and that, win the competitions, um, play with gazoos and that, and away we went. And then after that, when it was all over, I just remember going down on the fairgrounds and enjoying the day, the rest of the day on the shores. It was a fantastic day. Well, picnic day was one day when you didn't have it. Get the bands up sharp because they had you up sharp. Because they wanted to be there when the bands started playing. Because mind, we were putting the crofting. That was the band that used to win all of the... That was yeah, the best one. Yeah, yeah. 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 that was all. <laughs> <laughs> and if you want... In Bedlington, on the street, when the band started playing, and mind you could tell if it was cooking and cropping playing, the band used to cry, hurry up, man, they're going to be finished, because we had to be there for cooking and crofting playing. But never mind, after that, we used to go to the show. They used to have a field with the shows. And this year, Dennis had been lucky. We were at this stall, and it had you know, you could win either goldfish or butchies. Can you mind it? There was goldfish bowls and you hide the, tennis, the table tennis balls in. But never mind, he had one two goldfish. And we're on our way back to the bus. Heavens opens up and Warden he started crying, Man, we'll have a hurry, the water's getting into the fish. Why the fish goldfish weren't worth her in any place? But you thought they were going to drown because the rain was coming down. <laughs> you thought you were going to get wet, didn't you? I know. When I used to take the beds and I'd do them all with the family that way, we used to follow the band, walk behind them, whatever, like, you know, and we used to go on the show grounds. And uh, they used to play on their own boat, the swingers, and all the rest of it. And I used to go on the coconut trails when they were there. And I used to go to high coconut. The bloody things would never fall off. I'm trying to go to the I'm not bloody good. They would never come off. And for a drink, we used to go for a drink. We used to stand beside the bar. I would say the pub and just have a drink while marching by the uh, people and that and the, the banners and everything. And that's how we used to enjoy the picnic area. Well, mind you, I remember some young lads used to walk behind the banners with right. a glass of beer and that. Oh, and yeah. they used to yeah. 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 Yeah, I just stood outside the club. I did have my march. Ladies and gentlemen, we are the tears.